Hi, it's a sunny and pleasant Monday morning here in upstate New York, and I'm joined again by my son, Jeremy, who is on audio only, we have some video technical difficulties, but we're going to proceed with uh, with an audio version of the Zogby Report, real and unscripted. How you doing out there, Jer? I'm well. How about you? I'm doing well. So here we are on a Monday. And um, what I want to entitle uh, this version is, um, is it the chainsaw or is it the scalpel? And I'll tell you what that's all about. Of course, Argentina, third largest economy in South America and an important player on the world stage, uh, elected a libertarian yesterday, uh, Javier Millet, uh, ending years upon years of Peronist rule, and he campaigned uh, up until the last week anyway, when he modulated his image, he campaigned with a chainsaw. He said, Argentina's a mess, uh, spending is out of control, Argentina's debt is unsustainable, and we have to cut, and the only way to cut, that was a symbol of the chainsaw, is massive cutting. And so he won. He won convincingly, 56 to 44 percent. No one really anticipated that. Uh, I'm going to take only a minute on Argentina because what I really want to do is obviously talk about the United States and the implications here. He was endorsed by uh, former President Trump and congratulated by Trump as well. But essentially, uh, when he says that Argentina is a mess, there is no question about it. It has been uh, in debt for years. It has uh, a, 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 an inflation rate that is unfathomable, pushing at a, almost 150%. Uh, the debt is such that on at least a couple of occasions, the IMF has had to forgive the debt uh, because it was, there was just no way Argentina could pay it back. Argentina, when its debt wasn't being forgiven, has renegotiated its debt many, many times. But at some point, you have to pay the piper. And at some point, you got to figure out a way to get out of debt. Argentina, because of its economic issues, um, has uh, had a generous uh, welfare state, but an inability to uh, function in a in a balanced budget to provide that kind of state. And so now Argentina faces turmoil. Um, there is strong opposition to the new president. There will be efforts, certainly, uh, as we speak, to undermine him. Uh, the budget has to be cut. On one hand, anybody can get a chainsaw, anybody could get a butcher knife and just start hacking away, hacking away, hacking away. Uh, at the at the budget and cutting slashing programs. On the other hand, if you use a scalpel, then you know, more be, might be more responsible. But does it really get at the debt issue? And so, with that said, uh, what are the implications here for the United States? I mean, we're at a thirty-three trillion dollar debt, and it does not appear as if um, anybody is prepared to deal with that. Sure, Republicans talk, and when Republicans are in power, Democrats talk about the size of the debt. But then every time there's a budget crisis, the can gets kicked down the road. We'll renegotiate it and keep the government open the next six weeks or four weeks or whatever the case may be. I'm only going to end by suggesting twice in the last 30 years uh, there have been serious discussions, one about the debt. Uh, one was um, under early Clinton, the Grace Commission, headed by Vice President Al Gore, came out with tons of recommendations, a huge book of where uh, programs could be cut or eliminated. And then uh, years later, around 2010, under Barack Obama, the uh, Bowles Simpson Committee, for, formed with Democrats and Republicans, 
I should say, came up with a, a serious plan that even included raising the eligibility for Social Security, even included, uh, you know, some sacred cows within the budget. And uh, both efforts were defeated. And I might add equally by Republicans and by Democrats. Uh, and yet, a day of reckoning is coming. We have to protect social programs. We have to protect a safety net. But by the same token, $33 trillion in debt and kicking the can down the road. Is Javier Malay onto something? Is this the future of the United States? Does this enhance Donald Trump's re-election, who has promised in a second term bypassing channels and eliminating whole programs and government agencies in the United States. What do you think, Jer? Hmm. Well, that's a lot. It um, is. Yeah. Uh, so the implications for the United States, yeah, there's a lot. There's an economic parallel. There's a political parallel. I mean, I'm just kind of, um, as you kind of just threw it out there, I'm going to respond and throw it out there. I mean, first of all, Argentinians are very sophisticated people. Mm -hmm. uh, Argentina at one point was one of the top 10 wealthiest nations in the country or in the world, I'm sorry, just only a hundred years ago. Um, and you have, so you have a history of sophistication, but for decades, Argentina has been plagued by corruption, by bureaucrats, um, by leaders like, you know, the Kirchner and Perón dynasty. And the citizens have been living under decades, uh, under uh, essentially a banana republic, um, under hyperinflation. I mean, they've pretty much just grown accustomed to uh, imagine a country where the average citizen, probably in their head, on any given day knows the exchange rate between their currency and a basket of other currencies. I mean, we don't live like that. We can't imagine that. Imagine that though. And then have to go to the black market and we'll accept other currencies because their national currency is, is continuously being debased. Now, that's a key point there because this is a historical observation. I, I would almost say that this is a law of history that when a nation debases its currency, as a result, the culture gets debased. Uh, I could spend a whole podcast on that, but I won't. Uh, just take my word for it. Inflation erodes away at the value of the currency and negatively impacts the culture. And so Argentinians are angry uh, and, they're, and they're upset. About 10 years ago, there was a big election. I can't remember the guy's name. He, he went off uh, against Kirchner and... Um, he won, and and he was promising to cut the gnocchis. The the gnocchis uh, in in Argentina are the bureaucrats. They're they're the people with government jobs who uh, collect a monthly salary for practically doing nothing. And um, and then there was a lot of hope around that, and that didn't really go anywhere. Argentina still in its problem. Um, what this guy did was very Trumpian. Um, he, he, on the one hand, is, is very economically principled. He's, he's not a stupid guy. He's a well-read economist who's probably familiar with every modern school of, of economy, of economics, from Keynesian and neoliberalism to Austrian-style uh, free market economics to classical-style free uh, market economics. Uh, and and while that is great, the problem is his um, approach was very Trumpist. Uh, he, he is a uh, shock and awe. There's a lot of shock value there. He is quite ridiculous, uh, in, in my opinion, if you look at some of his interviews and, and the rage and, and the, the, the way that he communicates about, quote unquote, left tards and shit tards, as, as he calls them. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, I think the big takeaway from all of this is anger won over fear. Um, the Peronists 
were projecting the message and, and delivering the message that if Malay wins, what you're going to have is the end of Argentinian democracy. And so they were instilling a, a sense of fear that say goodbye to your country um, if, if you elect this guy, to which the majority of the population uh, apparently have nothing to fear. And instead, what drove them was the rage, what was the anger. Malay had this, um, you know, very critical of central banks, um, very critical of big government. And so I think the, the, the simplest way to understand this is, is anger won over fear. But my concern is that's a recipe for disaster. You know, uh, that's, a re that's a recipe for a revolution spiraling out of control. It's, it's one thing to want to take a chainsaw and to cut, as he says, cut 18 ministries down to eight uh, and, and, and a whole other slew of, of things. And, and, and I think dollarize the country. You know, I think what he means is make it legal to own and hold and, and trade dollars, um, effectively allowing for competing currencies, which is a free market idea. And, and all that sounds great, but the way that he projects it in in this this you know very angry um, uh, style is very reminiscent of 2016 and 2020. And by the way, that's not just pinning the blame on Trump and MAGA. That's pinning the blame on the opposition too. And so, what I'm afraid is what 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 is is likely to happen is anger versus fear can spiral out of control. Now, to to the point of the debt and hyperinflation and the abysmal con economy that um, Argentinians face. I'm reminded of Ernest Hemingway's uh, famous quote in one of his novels. Um, the character asked to another character, you know, so, so how did it happen when asking about bankruptcy to which the other character replies hauntingly, slowly, then suddenly. And so Argentin uh, Argentina is about at that point where they are going to go suddenly off the cliff. Um, I, I, back to your question about the implications of that, uh, I am of the mindset that not just the United States, but a lot of countries have gone into a vast experiment of currency creation and inflating the currency and making do on all these promises. The biggest problem with the United States is that not only do we have a welfare state, but we have a warfare state. So really, the, 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 the defining feature of the United States is a welfare warfare state model, which means trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars coming from both angles. Um, and so something is going to have to give. And, uh, you know, can can Malay show uh, show show us the way? Uh, I would like to think so. But with his style of um, populist rage, I think he's, unfortunately, he may very well pour uh, fuel on the flame. And um, as I already stated two or three times, that is recipe for a fierce revolution. Well, it's a bleak outlook and I share it. Um, you want to give anybody who is newly elected the benefit of the doubt and, and the hope that they can deliver. Um, there is perhaps a potential that Argentina of the 2020s could be the Chile of the mid to late 1990s with a restoration of, of a free market and a, an economic boom, at least for a while. On the other hand, the Argentina of the, the 2020s could turn into the Argentina of the late 70s and 1980s, which was really one of the most horrible dictatorships. And, 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 and we're cognizant and we feel the horror, the brutality of that dictatorship, because as you pointed out, the Argentina Argentinians are a sophisticated people and had been accustomed to, um, to better uh, than uh, the violations of human rights and the deaths, massacres, in fact. But with that said, let's end on the note. What what does this portend for the for the U.S.? Is there a reckoning in 2024? Uh, Joe Biden 
has been out trying to tout um, Bidenomics, you know, and the the rescue, the money spent on infrastructure, the uh, the turn towards a more green economy, the fact that um, there has been a considerable amount of domestic spending, and that has produced um, a substantial number of jobs, reduced unemployment, and so on. But it appears it's falling on deaf ears. Mm. Um, and that, uh, you know, his numbers as we speak are, are uh, continue, you know, in the high 30s, uh, low 40s. Um, he's not able to get his message out. Meanwhile, Donald Trump leads. He leads in the, in the national polls. He leads um, uh, in, uh, in, the, in battleground states. We're certainly not suggesting we have, we have no idea what's going to happen a year from now in terms of electoral politics. But is the chainsaw a winning message for Donald Trump? Um, I, I, I think what the winning message is going to be, I think this election is going to be about driving the younger vote, the 18 to 44 Um why that is, I think, is because, you, you know, I remember I remember back in 2008, and I know Obama is, is a baby boomer, but he, he's, he's like one of the youngest of the, the, the baby boomers. And so it was almost like he was a Gen X in, in many ways, um, especially because he had the appeal to the young. But I remember Uncle Jim, your, your brother, my uncle, saying that, he, he said in 2008, he said, we baby boomers should just forfeit our uh, leadership in the presidency. And that hasn't been the case. I mean, we, we've still been governed um, by baby boomers. But I mean, I think just by the virtue of, of, of chronology and a timeline, we're at a point now where uh, I think the, the torch is being passed. And it's, it's at some point, it's going to be passed probably to, to, to Generation X in terms of presidential leadership, which means is a signal that uh, the, the young vote, the 18 to 44 year olds are going to come out uh, uh, more. I mean, just just in sheer numbers you have today, you have more millennials than you have baby boomers. But this is this is the other implications of that is is uh, economics. Um, baby boomers have amassed the greatest wealth uh, that any generation has ever amassed in, in human history. And what you have on the, the young end, the 18 to 24 year olds, is a, a sense of, of hopelessness in terms of uh, economics and, and, and personal finance. I mean, people in their 20s and 30s are, are stalling, uh, getting married and having kids. Now, look, some of that, some of that. It may, may be driven by concern for the environment and, and the climate, but I'll tell you right now, most of it is because of debt, because of, of stagnant wages, because of price uh, the, being priced out of the housing market. It is just not a, a condition where where somebody wants to start a family and, and feels like they can get ahead. And so w w I think... The biggest thing is is so you know when when we're looking at economics is is the generational factor and you know whoever can offer a more promising message to those who are eighteen to twenty four those who are twenty five to uh, forty or forty four year olds uh, with with some kind of you know uh, more hope and, and less dire, I think, is what, what's really going to win the day. And, and, and I guess the point of all of this is Joe Biden can't do that. Joe Biden won't do that because he can't do that, because he has aligned himself so much with Bi uh, Bidenomics. And Bidenomics just does not work for those younger than 45. OK, and I will end on the note that I seriously doubt that Donald Trump can do that, too. Uh, yeah, I don't either. Yeah. And um, well, so well, well, I'm sorry. Well, let me just say this, though. I mean, what, what the fascination that and there was a fascination among the younger vote among Trump was that he was a self-made businessman. Mm -hmm. And so and, and I'm seeing this in the polling that um, am, among the black vote who are, 
you know, a little bit increasingly interested in Trump. I, I, I don't I think a lot of that is this fascination with with the self-made businessman. And so not so much his programs, but what he represents in terms of, hey, it's OK to make money and, and I'll help you make money. Yeah, I think that's wearing off. Um, but that's another topic for uh, another day. Um, um, but that certainly was an earthquake in Argentina yesterday. And let's see how it plays out. Have a good week. Yes, you too. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.